Benjamin, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It has been a while since I've been here. Yeah. Actually, almost a year. And I've missed all of you. My family is indeed so grateful for all of the prayers, the phone calls that we have gotten since we have been absent. And even the letter that I got sent from this church was such a beautiful letter. Uh, and we are so grateful for that. We love you all. We miss you all. I've actually asked my employer to transfer me back here. Uh, I really, uh, it is in God's hands whenever that's going to happen. We really didn't want to leave. Uh, but when you have an employer that is, um, they have a way of getting you to do something you really don't want to do, you know. And uh, so that, that zero that was added is not really that much of a problem now. Uh, so uh, we are praying very much that God sent us back here. Uh, and as soon as that opportunity comes, we will return. Amen. Uh, there is one other thing I want to say. I did hear about the, uh, the Daytona church and meeting the pastor. I have not been asked that. I just heard that from someone. And so uh, I don't know what is going to transpire with that. Uh, teaching the word of God and preaching is what I do. It is part of me. I love doing it, and if the opportunity comes for us to do this, uh, whenever it does, because it will, uh, we will be obedient to the will of God. Amen. Um, having said that, I want to begin by um, telling the church that there are things that are going on that affect and will affect every person here. There is something called the internet. The World Wide Web, created many years ago for the purpose of passing information from one area to another in an expedient fashion. And now we have cell phones that can look at television around the world. And the internet has enabled us to be able to transfer information in seconds. And I don't know if anybody looks at the internet because it's, uh, there are some things on the internet that affect the church, believe it or not. There is um, a story that is on the internet that says the world is coming to an end on September the 25th. I don't know if anybody's heard this. The world is coming to an end. There is a comet that's headed for the earth, and it will hit the earth sometime in the week of September 25th. There's another report that says the fault lines underneath the California uh, mountain range is going to erupt at any time. There's another report that says that the magma underneath Yellowstone National Park is due to erupt on the week of September 25th. Underneath Yellowstone, there is enough magma to fill the entire Lake Michigan four times. And if it is, erupts, it will be catastrophic. These are reports. There's another report that says that we're getting a visitor in this country from the pump. Pope Francis will be here September the, what is it, the 25th, around that same time. And he is going to meet with President Barack Obama. Then he's going to do something that no pontiff has ever done in history. He will meet with a joint session of Congress. Well, what does this have to do with the church? It has a lot to do with it. These things are coming. There's really scary things that is coming to the church and that affect us. Globally, our church is growing in leaps and bounds. And that's a good thing. That's a very good thing. But I want y'all to understand something. There is a movement that is going on around the world. Not just in the United States, but it's around the world. This movement has different names. Some people call it spiritualism. There's other names for it, 
But I'm going to tell you exactly what this movement is and why it is so powerful that it is affecting every church member, every person that believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you're going to have to make a decision. And your decision is going to be based on whatever knowledge you have about the Word of God or where will we be based on this Word. Here is what they're saying. That we in the Seventh-day Adventist Church have become so legalistic about the Sabbath that the Sabbath does not become just another day of the week and it doesn't matter what day you go to church. We do not embrace the Sabbath because of our communion with God. We only keep it because of the law. This is the movement. We are, they are discrediting our very purpose for being here. And it is working. There, are, there is a Christian organization, I call it Christian in title, that's going around, that's from the Catholic Church, from the Pope, a letter that was sent to every major Christian organization on the face of the globe. One of the things that's in this letter is asking for an alliance, a signed alliance with the Catholic Church that will unite all Christian churches. Doesn't matter whether you're Baptist, Catholic, Methodist, Church of God in Christ, Lutheran, Presbyterian, no matter what you are. There are some very prominent pastors, ministers, and church leaders that have already signed this. They are signing allegiance to this organization. The world is trying to create one global religion. At the same time, our government and governments in other countries is trying, and they are succeeding, to create one world government. When you have one world government and one world church, what is going to happen when they combine? These things are real. They are happening every day right underneath our feet. There is a meeting that has been planned for the week of September 25th in Washington, D.C. This meeting, and I'm not talking about the meeting that's in Philadelphia with uh, Pope Francis. But this meeting is going to unite church leaders in Washington, D.C. Oh, some of y'all know about it. Yeah. And I want you to understand something. Some of the, and I, I, can name every, I can name every one of these pastors, and you would know every name that I name, have already pledged alliance and allegiance to this organization. And the reason that they're doing it, the reason that they're doing it, is out of greed and lust. It's over money. You see, economically, we have some problems in certain areas of the world. And these problems extend into war, one with the other. And you know what's the funniest thing is? That when you hear these reports, they're actually quoting scriptures to support them. Or shall I say misquoting scriptures. And where does that leave us? Where does that leave those of us who believe we are the remnant church? Those of us who understand what the Sabbath is really about. You know, it's interesting. We was in the Sabbath school class today, and they were talking about what the Sabbath is really about. It's not about legalism. It's not about because it is one of the Ten Commandments. Although, I'm not saying that, that I'm lacking the importance of the Ten Commandments. We don't keep it simply because it's the law. The Sabbath is about an embracement. It is about the fact that our Father, our Father, Amen. His presence, His very presence is the Sabbath. Amen. It's the culmination of His creation every week. Amen. This is the reason why we stop working. This is the reason why we should embrace coming together. This is the reason why we strengthen each other. This is what the Sabbath is about. And the reason, the very nature of the Sabbath is in question today. Both legally, ethically, and morally. What are we going to do? They're going to come into our churches. They're going to be sitting in our pews. They're going to be right at the pulpits. 
singing in the choir. And they're going to tell you that we're leaders. They're going to tell you what difference does it really make. And then they're going to tell you that Sunday, the first day of the week, is the day we should be keeping. Why? Because it makes sense for business. It's about business. In order to protect the global industry, we cannot worship every day of the week. The mark of the authority of the Catholic Church on its people is the Sabbath. So when they take the Sabbath and they degrade it and make it come down to just one, either you're a legalist or it doesn't matter what day of the week, you'd be confused. And during all that confusion, some of us are going to take our Bibles and say, that is not what my Bible says. Amen. Jesus Christ knew this. And I'm going to start with the scripture we read, we read today. The Bible says in Luke chapter 21, verse 36, Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be counted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Watch as well as pray. Why? Does the Bible say that we should be praying? That seems obvious. Because this movement is very, very strong. It's powerful. See, deception is not to come and say the light is red, keep going. That's not deception. Deception is when it's yellow and they tell you, oh, don't, don't worry, you can make it. Go ahead, go ahead. That's the deception. When it comes down to actually defending the Sabbath to uh, it doesn't matter what day of the week it is, that's deception. Amen. When it comes down to uh, power and control, it's deception. Because this is a business day. And the purpose of business is to make money. You know, the only thing the only thing that separates us from those that truly don't believe is the Sabbath. Because you can go in any church, and every church claims they keep all of the commandments. Every church does. I've never been in a church that said, well, we, 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 oh, we, don't, we don't keep that commandment. No, say they keep it. Because they disassociate what the Sabbath is really all about. And we in the church... If we have people here in the church that do not embrace the Sabbath, don't know what it's really all about, it's only here because this is the day we come to church, then we got a problem. We need to know what we believe in. We need to be able to stand on what the Word of God says. Amen. I want you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to read verses, uh, I'm read verse 14. Say amen when you have it. Amen. amen. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 14, the Bible says, are we ready? Yeah, You're here in pages. I want everybody with you. You know? The Bible says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every whim of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Are we at that point today? Yes. Are we at the point where our government is in bed with the church? And it's the wrong church? Are we at a point where we feel so minority as a church that some of us are even leaving the church? And going out on our own. The Bible says this day will not come except there be a, a falling away. Falling away means we ain't coming together anymore. Means we, we doing it on our own. I call it Burger King faith. Anybody remember Burger King? Have it your way, hold the pickle, hold the lettuce? Is that the kind of faith that we have in the church today? That we just want to have it our way? We're not worshiping in accordance with the Bible? On one side, we have true worship. 
On the other side, we have religion. Religion is this big. It's all over the place. Religion's got the, the entertainment. They got the drums in the church. They got the dancers in the church. Religion's got these huge buildings that look like, wow, what, look at all that. That's religion. Religion says as long as you're putting something in the collection plate, you're okay. We don't need your tithes. They don't even call it tithes anymore. Just pass the plate. They even tell you how much to put in it. With true worship over here, where is that at in the church today? When we come to the pulpit and we come into the sanctuary, are we really here to worship God? Are we really here to honor our Redeemer, our Sustainer, our Creator? Is His signature on our spiritual checks? Or is it just religion? I want you to turn with me to the book of John. John chapter 14. I'm going to read verse 1, 2, and 3. In the trouble that we face today, sometimes we need to remember something. Sometimes we need to go back to the beginning. When we first became a Christian, when we first understood what the Sabbath was about, in enthusiasm, even if it was out of ignorance, it's okay to be ignorant. We're all ignorant about something. <laughs> but when you choose to remain ignorant, that's when I got a problem. The Bible says in chapter 14, verse number 1, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Does anybody in here live in a mansion? Oh, you might not want to admit it. Does anybody know what a mansion is? You know, we usually describe mansions as these big, elaborate, I mean, they're beautiful, and it's breathtaking homes, right? We see them on the television all the time, and the, the celebrities have these big mansions, right? And we associate the word mansion with that. But I'm telling you now, that's not what the Bible's talking about. When the Bible says, I will go and prepare a place for you, Jesus himself is preparing a place for you. It will be something that your eyes will be overwhelmed. overwhelmed. Bible says, eyes have not seen, nor ears have heard. Nor is what entered into the heart of men and things that God has for him to love. Amen. Keep his Amen. So we cannot imagine how the mansion is going to look like. We have no idea. We, there's nothing compared to it. That's how good it is. The Bible says we will not be bored not one day in heaven. Not one day. Every day we will be amazed at what we see and what we learn for eternity. So much more than what we have here on earth. I mean, if you look at the, the most elaborate mansion you can imagine here on earth with a fountain in the front door or the fireplace everywhere or whatever you like, you know, looking out over the ocean or whatever, that'd be nothing compared to what we, God has placed for us. Amen. Yeah. But there's a choice. There is a choice that you have to make. Whether we are going to follow what the Bible says or we are not. And here's a clue. Sometimes you look in the corner and you get a little clue. The clue is this. If you're not following all of it, you're not following any of it. There cannot, 90% won't work. Who wants the 90% making in heaven? Or who wants to make it 98%? Or 99%? Be right at the step and don't make it. It's not like when you take a test in school and you get 99% and say, I got 99%, I still got an 8. 99% is 1% that you didn't make it. Because understand something about righteousness. When you take on the righteousness of Christ, Amen. which is what we do when we repent Amen. and we're baptized, His glory is what's inside you. Amen. 
His glory is what comes out of you. God doesn't do anything halfway. He can't give you half of a blessing. You can't have half of his glory. That's not the way it works. You either have all of it, or you don't have any of it. When we break down the Sabbath to end up being our way of life for or against God, then you don't have any of his glory. You are operating out of your own power Amen. in flesh. And our flesh has already lost the battle. Amen. In flesh, we have already lost. And some of us, some of us, are still living in the flesh. This is why I brought up all of these reports that are out. Because there are things that are going to happen and that's going to continue to happen that you will not be able to compare anything to because they've never happened before. Some of us, the Bible is clear, some of us will be in prison for our faith. Some of us will even be killed for our faith. If you're not prepared to die for your faith, then you're missing something. Because I want you to imagine something. If a couple came to the pastor of this church, and they said they wanted to get married, and the pastor says, well, I cannot marry you because you're all the same sex, and I, I can't do that. And the couple says, well, okay, since you said no, we're going to report you. And since it's the law, Somebody comes to visit the pastor. They don't even bother to wait until he's finished preaching. And they just take him out. And now he's in jail. Because he violated a court order. By not marrying two people of the same sex. And you say, well, I'm not the pastor. That's not my problem. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> because each one of us is going to have to make that type of a decision. Amen. And if you don't know what the Bible says, you're going to be deceived. Amen. You're going to take the safe route. Well, I don't really believe this, but I'm going to go along with it. I had a meeting a week ago. Was it a week ago? Ten days ago. With the pastor of a Sunday church. Now, he has a pretty large church. The mayor goes to his church. The police chiefs go to his church. Me and my wife sat down with him and his wife. The question was very simple. Why are you preaching on Sunday? Why are you preaching on the first day of the week? The biggest difference between our churches, between what we belong to and what he belonged to, there was actually, there was three things that we talked about. One was the Sabbath, two was the rapture, and three was the state of the dead. Because we have differences. And I asked him, why are you preaching on the first day of the week? You know what he told me? He had three different answers in less than 10 minutes. The first answer was because it's the Jewish Sabbath and we don't have to keep that. Well, what was it in Genesis? It couldn't have been Jewish Sabbath in Genesis. So what was it in Genesis? Well, no, no, I, you know, no, the reason we don't keep it is because it really doesn't matter what day of the week. The Sabbath is just a principle. And as long as you take one day off a week, you're okay. This is what a Sunday pastor said. This man has a, he preaches to 150 people every week. After I showed him several scriptures, he says, well, you know, I think we keep it because the early church kept this first day of the week. <laughs> there you go. Then I showed him a scripture in Isaiah 66 that we're going to be keeping the Sabbath even in heaven. You know what he told me? He said, you know, I've never seen that before. This is a pastor. He's got 14 missionaries underneath him. And he says he's never seen that scripture before. Then he told me something that was even more amazing than that. You know what he told me? Sunday pastor. Me and my wife got ready to leave. I said, we did what we had to do. We just told him the truth. He said, you know, I'll tell you something. If worship is mandated by law, I'm not going to have anything to do with it. That's what he said. He's not going to have nothing to do with it. He's going to tell Satan, no, I'm not going to have nothing to do with you. But you're preaching on Sunday right now. Right. And this same deception is going through the church. Amen. Because you know, it doesn't matter what level you're on. 
You can be ignorant at any level. The Bible says even the elect can be deceived. Amen. Some of us in here could be the elect. And if we don't know what the Bible says, we can and will be deceived. I thought that was pretty amazing. Amen. But I told my wife, I said, you know, as ministers of the gospel, we have to give them the truth. Amen. We weren't trying to convert him. I didn't, he ain't here today. We gave him a CD, gave him the word of God, and that's it. And once we saw him opening up his book, this book, now I said, well, I guess we did something right. But some of us have some of these same deceptions. Every movie you look at has deception in it. Every song you listen to has deception in it. Even some of these so-called gospel records has some deception in it. What is Isaiah 820? Somebody turn it back for me, please. Isaiah 820. There's deception all over the place. How do you know if it's deception? What's Isaiah 820? To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to the word, how much light is in it? There's no light in it. Are we taking these same movies, these same music, some of these people you know, and putting them against the word of God? You know, I recently talked to a young lady who uh, said she was having problems in her marriage. She was talking to me and my wife. She says, well, I still love my husband. We've been separated. But I'm waiting for God to tell me to go back to him. He's been unfaithful. He did this. He did that. But I still love him. What should I do? I simply told her that, you know, we don't really do uh, tell someone to leave someone. We don't do that. But I tell her, I said, you know what? You have to take your life. And you have to filter it through this. You take your husband's life, you filter it through the Bible. In Matthew 6, 33, the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom. Yeah. And all these things be added unto you. If you put God first, if he puts God first, then you'll have a peace of mind. Because all the other problems will work itself out. We need to have a foundation. If we do it backwards, which most people do, they feel that they want to fix their husband and didn't go to God. That's backwards. That is backwards because there's no foundation. If the foundation is the Word of God, you feel to anybody. And this goes whether you're single, whether you're young, old, doesn't matter. Anybody you meet, you take any relationship and you filter it through the Bible. And you know if somebody's being sincere to you or not. You know if somebody's being having some integrity or not. Whether that be a friendship, whether that be a future spouse, even your church. That's what we need to do. Filter it through the Word of God. Amen. And when it, what comes out on the other end is only because when you filter it through this, the only thing that comes out is the truth. Amen. The only thing that comes out is the foundation for the truth, which is the Word of God. That's the only thing that can come out of this is love. Amen. If we took some of our relationship and we filtered it through this, you wouldn't get love out of it. And that tells you right there whether we should be separating ourselves from some of these people. Now, I didn't, you know, I don't like to, uh, to stand in the pulpit and tell people what they should and shouldn't do. I just want to reveal what the Word of God says. So if we're living in the last days, which we are, what is it that we're supposed to do? What is a good watchman? The Bible says watch as well as pray. We already talked about why we need to pray. And that could go on for, I could talk for a week on why we need to pray. We need to be in our spiritual sense. We need to be using our spiritual gifts. Some of us are not using our spiritual gifts. Why do you have them if you're not using them? And it gets me to the word when it says watch. Now when you say, when the Bible says watch as well as pray, what does, he, what does Jesus Christ mean when he said watch? When he said the word watch, most of the time we think, but wait a minute, that's some sort of stationary observation. I can sit on a perch and watch something. Is that what Jesus is talking about when he said watch as well as pray? Did he say we should be standing and just looking at everything that's going on? 
in, in some observance? Is that what he means? What is a good watchman? What are we supposed to be doing while we're waiting on Jesus Christ to come back? Someone who's alert and spread the truth and preach that message. A good watchman is responsible for everything in his area of jurisdiction. Everything. Every person in your circle of influence. 